This is Jamal Ben Omar, Chair of International Center for Dialogue Initiative, a platform that is dedicated to uh, supporting local initiatives in the field of conflict prevention, uh, conflict resolution, and supporting mediation and national dialogues. When we started a few years ago, our focus was on the traditional conflict that emanated from the Arab Spring, Yemen, Libya, Syria, and also uh, we paid particular attention to the situation in the Sahel, um, particularly with its links with the, um, uh, the, the conflict in North Africa and Libya in particular. But the recent event, you know, compelled us, you know, to pay more attention to the long-standing conflict um, in Israel, Palestine. Um, in the beginning, we thought that there is a whole industry in Washington dedicated to this and uh, usually dominated by former administration officials from both parties. And we thought, you know, there was probably little, you know, that uh, we can add. However, um, when we look at the history of um, the so-called peace process, um, definitely it, um, um, uh, it's one that had many, many flaws. And um, the central flaw to that process was the absence of um, ownership, the real ownership by the people affected by this conflict. And um, um, uh, it was far you know, from being um, an inclusive pro process. And um, um, one also that, is, that complies with the, an international law framework. Our angle today is not going to be the history of the conflict itself or its dynamics, but the, a focus more on the diplomacy aspect of it. Um, and in this context, you know, we're going to ask you know, some hard questions on why this conflict is lingering on, has been going on for decades and decades with no end in sight. Without uh, 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 further introductions, let me um, introduce our participants um, in this podcast, in this dialogue. Um, we, have, we are very pleased to have with us um, uh, Moin Rabbani, uh, co-editor of Jadalia magazine. He previously served as senior analyst on the Middle East and special, also a special advisor on Israeli-Palestine with the International Crisis Group and um, was head of political affairs in the office of the Special Envoy for Syria in 2014-2015. Uh, welcome, Wayne. We're delighted to have you. Thank you, Jamal. Very pleased yeah. to be here. We're pleased also to have with us Michael Omer Mann, um, who is Dawn's Director of Research for Israel-Palestine. Um, and um, he has covered this issue for more than 10 years. He has served as the Editor-in-Chief of the Plus 972 magazine. Throughout his career, he has focused on Israel and Palestine grassroots movements and civil society campaigns, legislative trends, public opinion, as well as diplomatic and other efforts uh, to strengthen the uh, 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 accountability uh, in, and the rule of law. As we have seen in the news today, um, the bombardment of Gaza has resumed. Um, this conflict has claimed the life of um, uh, more than 15. Every time we give a figure, we're not sure, you know, it, the figures are going up, obviously, but uh, definitely more than 15,000 so far. And um, um, noting also that half of the victims are children. Um, a lot has been said more recently about the origins of this conflict. Um, we've seen many assertions about um, uh, blaming the Palestinians for not accepting um, so-called offers from the other side. Um, um, we have seen discussions about, in the media, discussions about what they call the day after. Um, I don't know exactly what this means, but um, various schemes have been developed, you know, in, in Washington and, and in Tel Aviv on how they see this so-called day after. But the one thing that is missing really, you know, from this discussion, from all this debate and the conversations involving many pundits, you know, on the usual TV screens is 
the pros um, uh, the, the, with the Israeli government, um, it was thought to be the panacea for um, the problems of the Middle East. But um, the reality is that this made things worse. Um, so these two initiatives, these two, a lot has been said about them, and a lot has been written. Um, but um, let let let's hear, you know, from our uh, two guests what they think um, of um, what was le bilan or the outcome of um, these years of discussions, first about the Oslo process and then later on about normalization and the Abraham Accord. Let me start, you know, with the um, uh, first question. Um, and um, I will ask Moeen first, um, if you could kindly explain to our viewers um, the main element of um, the Oslo process and uh, why do you think it hasn't achieved its intended objectives? Yes, I think it's a very important question. Um, the Oslo process is often presented as a framework for a two-state settlement that failed. I think that's a misinterpretation of the 1993 Oslo Accords. Um, the accord itself is, I think, um, three pages in length. It's largely written in plain English um, with very little technical language. And I would therefore encourage viewers and listeners um, to look it up on the internet it's available on multiple websites and read it and what they will notice are several things is that first of all it never um, speaks about a two-state settlement as a preferred or even any outcome uh, the words occupation self-determination um, statehood for example are nowhere to be found in those um, agreements. And so my interpretation is that in the aftermath of um, the huge changes in both the region and globally as a result of the first intifada, um, the Kuwait crisis, um, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Israel came to a realization that the status quo was untenable. And the Oslo um, Accord was its way of reformulating its relationship with the Palestinians um, in a way that would, on the one hand, consolidate Israeli control over those areas of the occupied territories it wanted to permanently incorporate into Israel, and at the same time, bringing in its former adversary um, the PLO as a partner in this process. Um, secondly, even if um, you uh, want to approach it as an agreement that was perhaps flawed, but had the real capacity to result in um, an implementation of what was then the international consensus on a resolution of the question of Palestine, which is essentially an Israeli withdrawal to the 1967 boundaries, um, uh, establishment of a Palestinian state with mutual recognition um, between the Arab states and Israel and a just resolution of the refugee question. Um, the only framework of reference that the Oslo agreements provide um, for what it terms uh, the permanent status or final status of this issue is a single reference to UN Security Council resolutions 242 and 338. Now, many people might look at this and say, well, isn't that exactly what should be the outcome of, um, uh, of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations? Well, yes, but because the problem is that Israel on the one hand, um, uh, largely supported by the United States and the Palestinians and the rest of the world on the other hand, have diametrically opposed interpretations of what those resolutions mean. To the world, it means an Israeli withdrawal to the 1967 boundaries and the just resolution of the refugee question. Israel maintains um, that the absence of the definite article before occupied territories in the English version of Resolution 242 
means that it's not obligated to withdraw to the 1967 boundaries. And it furthermore maintains that in the con context of the Egyptian-Israeli peace agreement of 1979, in which it relinquished the entirety, its occupation over the entirety of the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, it has already withdrawn from the vast majority of territories it occupied in 1967, and therefore has already essentially fulfilled uh, the requirements of resolutions 242 and 338. Um, thirdly, well, you might say, okay, um, parties involved in negotiations always disagree. That's ultimately why they need to negotiate. So then let's look at the arbitration mechanisms. Well, there are no binding arbitration mechanisms in the Oslo uh, Accords. In fact, the only arbitration mechanisms are ones which Israel consents to. In other words, so long as Israel were, is to withhold its consent for arbitration of, um, Israel, of disputes between the Israeli and Palestinian parties, whether about negotiations or implementation or anything else, there will be no um, uh, arbitration. So that was another fundamental flaw. And finally, and I would argue, despite me bringing it up last, it's, it's um, a key issue that needs to be taken into account, is that the Oslo um, uh, process was not an international process. Um, rather, it was a bilateral process in which Israel and the Palestinians, in contrast to virtually every other instance of decolonization that we've seen since 1945, where the occupier basically comes to the conclusion um, that the perpetuation of its occupation is no longer tenable and then negotiates with representatives of the occupied about mechanisms to uh, terminate the occupation and establish uh, a modus vivendi or a peace um, uh, or, or whatever. Um, the Oslo process was a bilateral um, agreement in which the status of the occupied territories was basically transformed within the context of this agreement from occupied territories, which is how they are classified under international law and by international consensus, into disputed territories in which Palestinian rights and Israeli claims um, were considered equally valid. Um, and on top of that, rather than this being a negotiating process held under, under uh, multilateral or international auspices, um, it was in effect a process um, that was conducted under the auspices, the uh, virtually exclusive auspices of the United States. And the role played by the United States as one of the key American participants in this process, Aaron David Miller, put it so accurately in an opinion piece in the Washington Post about 20 years ago, was that it functioned not as um, an honest broker or even a dishonest broker, but as, in his words, Israel's lawyer. So you had, in effect, where the vast disparity in a situation in which the vast disparity between Israel and the Palestinians was amplified by the custodian of the process who was, um, who on the one hand considered the more powerful party, Israel, a key strategic ally and considered the weaker party, the PLO, a terrorist organization um, uh, on probation. Um, and that's just getting into a few of the um, uh, issues. There are many more relating to delayed implementation and so on. If I could just make one final point about the implementation, I think a key issue to consider is, is that um, you can have an argument about whether Israeli actions or Palestinian actions were consistent with the Oslo um, uh, framework or violations of them. I think the more important point to make here is that Israel was never confronted with meaningful consequences, in fact, any consequences for its actions on the ground during the 1990s. The attitude of the West, of the United States and the European Union was, was that the process was sacred, uh, the process needed to be kept alive at any cost, 
And that cost was usually ignoring developments on the ground in the service of this chimera um, that was known um, as the peace process. And the predictable results, of course, was, was that the conditions on the ground to actually implement the international consensus became more and more distant with each passing year. Thank you, Moeen. Very interesting indeed. Um, let me turn to Michael now, and if you could um, kindly comment on um, what um, uh, Moeen said, his take on the, um, um, the, the, the the peace process, the Oslo peace process saga. Um, by today's standards, um, um, you know, how would you view that process? Um, when I say today's standards, and I'm referring to the standard that the United Nations developed about effective mediation, where the focus is on inclusion, is on um, uh, transparency, um, uh, the focus is on also on the impartiality of the mediator, um, um, using an international um, uh, international law framework um, when looking at these um, conflict situation, the centrality of human rights. You know, how, how do you view today um, this this, uh, this this process? And if you could pay also, you know, focus on um, drawing lessons um, that can be learned, you know, from that experience. Yeah. Um, first of all. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak here today. It's an honor to be in this company. Um, you know, I, I very much agree with everything that Moin said. Uh, things that, that doomed the process um, were, as, as was mentioned in the beginning, that there were no clear end goals um, defined. And, and that was done as a way to get the parties together because, you know, you you find the, the common ground that they can agree on. And, and they found that, I guess, at least in, in theory, but it, it led to vastly disparate expectations, um, which, you know, not only uh, precluded reaching a, a compromise or an agreement, but, but also led to great disappointment and frustration with um, not only the other side of the conflict, but the process itself. You know, the, the Oslo process over time came to be um, by both Israelis and Palestinians, um, something of a of a joke, um, because it, it had these these such it carried the hope of an era, and then and then created a worse a worse condition. Now, by today's standards, by the the metrics and the the things that you mentioned, I think that one of the biggest, if not the biggest, is uh, the lack of accountability which is that um, Israel has all the power in the situation, in the relationship. You know, the power dynamics are completely skewed. And nobody in the world is willing to, to, to provide consequences for, for its behavior. And we can talk about what those behaviors are um, in a few minutes. But, but it led to a situation where without a, a clear, you know, timeline without a clear, I mean, there's a timeline, but without any accountability to that timeline, without any accountability to the process, without any accountability toward the goals, which were undefined, at least for the first few years of, of, um, of Oslo, that it's, uh, you know, it, it, it was very hard to, 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 to re, to put it back on track once the um, once it was derailed. And, and that happened with the uh, assassination of Rabin and the second intifada. And, you know, there's there's tons of events that people point to as as uh, derailing or the death or the, the mortal wounding of, of the Oslo process. But it's but it's all of those things um, that you mentioned, you know, transparency is is huge. There was more of it on the Israeli side, um, and, you know, in the later stages of the process. And it can also domestic accountability. Um, you know, today, we one of the first things that I that I say when people talk about reviving, uh, you know, it's not so much in the past two months, but before that, reviving the Oslo process or, or a two-state process. You know, I, I remind them that there there isn't actually a representative Palestinian government right now. 
And Israel is not a democratic government for all of its the people under its control either. So it's it's you know the the idea that that a process is accountable to the stakeholders, to the people, which you mentioned at the beginning, and, and I assume we'll talk about that more. Um, the process itself was inclusive and transparent in that regard. Interests and and values of both sides, I don't think, were accurately represented to the other side, the demands um, as as either immutable or um, uncompromisable. And, and there you have things that are simply incompatible, like, you know, the idea of, of nationalist Zionism that sees the entire land of Israel as, as the Jewish homeland and where only Jews have sovereignty, along with, you know, even the idea of two states, right? Um, where, where Israel has for a long time, and Netanyahu already in the 90s was saying that, you know, he's, he's not actually going to follow through with this process. And on the Palestinian side, you know, the Israelis never believed um, and, and probably rightfully so, that, that the Palestinian leadership would ever give up the right of return uh, for, for the Israelis. Now, you know, in those two senses, particularly regarding the right of return, you know, there's a lot of talk on, on the Palestinian side about how that specifically um, made and continues to make the political representation, primarily of Yasser Arafat and uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who, who were willing to at least engage in talks on compromising um, refugee rights. You know, it's it's one of these places where I think a lot of people lived in fantasy land. Um, that that all you have to do is reach some sort of agreement, and and the the other seemingly intractable issues will will sort of resolve themselves. Um, that just getting people to the table is is the most important part. And and if surely you know that's that's very important. Um, but if you do it under false premises or under, um, under in a situation where neither side is willing to, to be fully open, both about what they're willing to give, but also get. Um, and, and I'm not saying that those things have to be you know, divulged in the negotiating room, but, but I don't think either side really um, knew that they had a domestic mandate to, to to do those sort of, to, you know, negotiate refugees, to negotiate, um, even giving up land, you know, the, the, the settler movement in Israel, the nationalist Zionist movement has grown immensely. And, and we all, we were only beginning to find out its power, um, in the nineties. And, and I think we're going to face a similar realization in the, in the coming weeks and months. We'll go back to um, 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 what a peace process uh, would look like uh, if, if there is one um, once the, you know this war is over. But still, just um, um, one comment on um, what you both said about the Oslo peace process. It, clearly, from what you are saying, is that um, uh, this question mark whether it was uh, at least question mark whether it was inclusive um, um, when it comes to um, um, who is um, at the table. Um, I remember uh, not all Palestinian voices were involved. I remember uh, or were in agreement, you know, with that approach taken by the Palestinian leadership that negotiated. I remember, um, and then you know there was the question that you raised, you know, the um, the mediator um, um, acting as a um, as a lawyer, you know, for one side, um, and pretending still to be mediator. Um, um, that was that proved to be very problematic indeed, and um, uh, I'm surprised that even today um, there are calls for the U.S. to resume that 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 role. It's like if we haven't learned anything uh, from that episode. Um, but apart from this, you know, let me you know uh, bring you bring the discussion to another um, uh, topic related. If I may interrupt, Jaman, um, before you do that, could I just make one? Uh, two brief points in, in response to uh, what Michael said. Yes. Um, uh, Michael raised the issue of accountability, and I think quite rightly um, uh, said that Israel um, was not confronted with um, 
or that I think his, his words were that, that no one was willing to confront Israel with the consequences of its actions. I think that's essentially right, but I would put it slightly differently, which is that those who were willing did not have the ability, and those that did have the ability were unwilling. Um, uh, and I think that's maybe an important point to raise because we're not just talking about the US and Europe here, but um, uh, about the international community as a whole. Um, second point on the refugee question um, and the right of return, I think one of, one of the problems of the terms of reference of the Oslo Agreement being so vague was that there was almost an expectation in Israel and, and in the West uh, more broadly, that if the Palestinians would obtain a state, um, that, that they would consent to the entire refugee question um, just vanishing and that um, uh, the right of return um, uh, would be more or less um, uh, formally uh, renounced. And, and the idea that, you know, they would set the Palestinian priorities which is quite similar to what we've seen in the misjudgment in, in the past few years in the Gaza Strip, that these are people who only care about governance, uh, for example. So I just wanted to briefly make those two points. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Moeen. Um, let me move to a second issue, um, again, that was driven by the United States, um, and it's this process of normalization, the Abraham Accords. Um, these accords were presented as the panacea for um, uh, the conflict in, in the Middle East. Um, uh, there were thoughts that um, um, they would bring prosperity, they would bring stability. And um, um, what we have seen is uh, that these accords um, have probably contributed you know, to the um, uh, current um, 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 flare-up. Um, uh, the theory there was that instead of negotiating Israel, negotiating directly with the Palestinians, they will um, normalize their relations with Arab countries and then the Palestinians at the end, you know, they will be compelled, you know, to accept whatever offers they will get, you know, from, the, uh, from, 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 from Israel. Um, when you look at the... Um, uh, the demonstrations that are taking place, you know, in the Arab world, in North Africa, from Morocco to um, uh, to Iraq, you, know, you will see that uh, there is a huge gap, you know, between the Arab regimes who signed up, you know, with Israel, um, who are part of the uh, Abraham Accord, and then the population that remain very firmly um, uh, supportive of the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian people. So, again, I want to ask both of you, if I can start with you, Moeen, um, what do you think, you know, the impact um, of this approach, you know, has been on this conflict? Well, I, I would maybe start by placing this again in the context of, of the Oslo Accords. Um, I think the Palestinian attitude to the Oslo Accords was that Israel's main interest in reaching an agreement with the PLO was not so much achieving peace with the Palestinians, but achieving peace with the Palestinians as the price of admission to normalized relations with the Arab world. In other words, the Palestinians hoped and expected that they could use their leverage over Israel in terms of um, controlling um, uh, the entry of Israel to the Arab world, that they could use that as leverage to get um, Israel uh, to agree to an implementation of the international consensus in the form of a two-state uh, settlement and end to the occupation and the just resolution of the refugee question. Um, and the Palestinians believed that, you know, with the exception um, uh, of Egypt, which had already normalized relations with the Arab world, um, they believed that, that they, in effect, held this Arab card in their back pocket, 
and could play it in order to achieve their strategic objectives. What we've had in um, the past two decades, and particularly um, uh, the last uh, 10 years, is a very different reality in which Israel, with the active support of the United States and the passive acquiescence, but increasingly um, active enablement of the Europeans, um, is in a situation where it has felt empowered to unilaterally resolve the core issues um, uh, of, of, of what's conventionally termed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and part of this has been that you've now also gotten these initially informal and increasingly more formal patterns of relationships between Israel and um, the Arab world and rather an Arab states and rather than those serving as an entry point um, uh, to achieve a resolution of the question of Palestine it has worked in reverse where now what you have is rather than Palestine and end to the occupation being a condition for Arab Israeli normalization Arab Israeli normalization is serving as um, a key instrument and leverage um, to pressure the Palestinians and to marginalize them um, uh, and to unilaterally seek to resolve these issues. And this, of course, reached its apex with the grandiosely entitled Abraham Accords uh, reached by um, uh, the Trump administration, where first you had um, an agreement between Israel and the Emirates in which um, the Emirates claimed that as a result of these agreements, Israel had suspended its plans for the imminent annexation of West Bank territory, where in fact, Israel for entirely different reasons had already um, uh, taken a decision not to proceed uh, with that act of annexation. Then you had an agreement with um, between um, Israel and Bahrain, which didn't even mention the Palestinians. And then you had an agreement between Israel and Morocco, which was uh, basically, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Morocco, as in the preceding Arab parties, issuing a halal certificate to the concept of greater Israel, and in exchange, Israel issuing a kosher certificate to the Moroccan annexation of, um, of uh, Western uh, Sahara. And so it developed into a situation where on the one hand, um, uh, Western parties uh, were, were leaving Israel to deal with the Palestinians as it saw fit on the assumption that, you know, this conflict is now in its um, eighth decade, the sky has yet to fall in, and we can safely ignore it while we focus on our other regional um, uh, priorities or global priorities as mo more recently on um, uh, Ukraine. And the region was increasingly um, involved with um, uh, other issues and normalizing relations uh, with Israel without attaching a Palestinian price tag to that. And I think it's, it's this marginalization of the question of Palestine that is key to understanding the crisis that um, erupted on October uh, on October uh, 7th. If I could just make one last point in terms of normalization, I think um, uh, many uh, journalists and, and, and quite a few analysts have suggested that um, one key motivation for Hamas on October 7th was to seek to undermine the prospect of a Saudi-Israeli normalization deal. I'm not convinced um, that's the case. Um, and the reason is that that agreement, had it come to fruition, was actually not so much a Saudi-Israeli as it was a Saudi-Israeli-American um, deal. And the key components of that deal were, on the one hand, an American commitment to provide Saudi Arabia with security umbrella, um, with, sorry, with uh, security guarantees and American delivery of um, uh, nuclear reactor and uranium enrichment capabilities to Saudi Arabia. Neither of those 
neither of those American commitments could have been fulfilled without the approval of the US Congress. And I think it is extremely unlikely that the US Congress uh, would have consented um, to those American initiatives. Secondly, um, part of that agreement would have consisted of Israel making certain gestures to the Palestinians, particularly the Palestinian Authority that, is, that it has systematically sought to weaken and emasculate over the past um, decade. And even though you can make the argument that the, the gestures Israel was being called upon to make were largely of a cosmetic nature, um, in the context of this Israeli government, they were simply a non-starter and, and would never have been offered. Um, but even if, if, if you nevertheless um, were to insist that yes, this was serious and an Israeli-Saudi agreement was imminent, um, looking at the historical record, there's no precedent um, uh, for um, Palestinian corpses, uh, if you will, serving to deter Arab-Israeli normalization. Um, in 1982, you had the Israeli invasion of Lebanon culminating in the Saudi, in the uh, Sabra Shatila massacres. It did nothing to derail the Egyptian-Israeli peace agreement of a uh, peace treaty of 1979. Um, similarly, um, uh, these uh, normalization agreements that were reached in uh, 2020 were entirely unaffected um, uh, by the huge uh, um, uh, eruption of demonstrations and uprising and latterly um, uh, another round of confrontation between Israel and the Gaza Strip in, uh, in 2021. And I think the Palestinians and Hamas in particular would have understood that if their goal had been to sabotage an imminent Saudi-Israeli deal, the most that they could have achieved would have been to uh, postpone it by a few months so that there would be a, a decent interval uh, between the burial of these uh, thousands of uh, Palestinians and the a public celebration of, of, of that agreement later. Thank you. Thank you, Moeen. Um, Michael, um, um, still on the Abraham Accords, um, uh, I want to see your take on um, you know, the widely uh, believed idea now that um, uh, these accords have backfired and the crisis. Um, I, I will answer that question, but I need to, to, to frame it a little bit first, um, which is starting with the, the Arab Peace Initiative in 2002, where, you know, Israel had been offered normal, normalization for more than 20 years now, and, you know, since 2002. But the thing, and with every Arab and, if I'm not mistaken, Muslim nation as well, in exchange for, for peace with the Palestinians. Now, the problem with that is that Israel had to pay the cost of that. The, the cost of that deal was on Israel. The Abraham Accords externalized that cost. And now neither the Arab states that have normalized with Israel nor Israel have really had to pay any meaningful price or compromise, uh, you know, they, in order to, to normalize relations, you, you had, you know, really, um, you know, open secret, uh, relationships of, of trade and, and, uh, you know, export of, of security, um, products from, from spyware to, to actual, um, weapons and water salination and technology and, you know, the, the relationships with, with the Emirates, with, uh, you know, even with Qatar, even with, uh, with Oman, with, with Morocco, like they've, they've, they were there already. They just weren't completely out in the open. So, so nothing, you know, sure there's flights and, and Israelis can travel to, to many more countries now, but the fundamental um, foundations of the relationships did not change. Um, and, and as Moen uh, mentioned, you know, they haven't paid it, the, the Arab countries have not paid a, rate, a price um, for this latest round of violence. Now, I would just say that, you know, Netanyahu in particular, but, but Israelis in general have for decades been fighting the notion of any linkage between the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the Arab-Israeli conflict. You know, one the, the larger and the other the smaller. 
because the United States and Europe and many others, including you know, many in the Arab world, um, most clearly expressed in uh, the Arab Peace Initiative, have made that linkage and said, no, you can't, you can't make peace. You can't be a part of your neighborhood until you resolve this, this issue. And Netanyahu in particular, but Israelis have been you know, saying, no, that's not true for decades. And in this, the, the Abraham Accords was a gift by, by Trump and then Biden saying, you know what? Let's go with your theory. And in doing so, they, they took away a big lever um, of pressure or at least um, positive incentive that could be offered to Israel, but that's never been effective anyway. I, I also don't think that Hamas did this to, um, at least as, as a major or driving factor um, to, to derail the Saudi normalization. Um, but, but again, it, it created this conception of, of far more um, transactional um, relationship that or a fantasy of a transactional relationship. Like all we, all we need to do is sell a few more weapons and we can ignore the Palestinians. All we need to do is it, whatever it is, but, but expand this, this Abraham Accords and, and prove to the world that no, 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 the Palestinian issue is not the main problem. Um, and, and the, you know, we, we saw that in, in this misconception that the thought that perhaps even, even Hamas, um, could be bought in that way. Um, if not directly, then through, um, through, uh, Qatar, but it's, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, it's true that it changed a whole lot with the exception of, um, what we believe is some sort of um, defense network uh, among Israel and, and many of the Gulf states, um, including an intelligence sharing and missile defense. But that's that's mainly aimed at Iran, and those things were more or less happening, not in a more inefficient way already. Um, so, so I, I'm sorry if I if I haven't gotten to the to the actual question, but but I do believe that. The fact that the United States agreed to, to pay the cost for normalization um, with the Arab world did a huge disservice to any building international pressure um, that the situation is unsustainable. And perhaps that pressure was built on a fantasy that there would be Arab pressure at some point, right? But we haven't seen that in, in, in decades, you know, not really since uh, the 1973 war. Has, has an Arab regime actually challenged Israel in a way that, that it had to um, perhaps rethink its, its uh, strategy for, for living in the neighborhood that it lives in. And, and lastly, um, I would just argue that I think, you know, there's some, there's some relief in, you know, this is, this is something that, that Israelis have a lot of angst about, right? About living the, the villa in the jungle idea. Um, and, and there was some relief in, in the idea that, that people can be accepted. Um, but in the tension between Europe and the Arab world, you know, Israel has never really fit in, um, into either. And, and I would argue that, you know, what we're seeing, the changes that we're seeing in Israel right now are moving it closer to, um, to the politics of the region. Um, you know, you have a conservative largely, largely. Uh, nationalist and religious uh, government that um, is consolidating power more or less uh, changing uh, the the regime to one less democratic for Jewish Israelis and and for the Palestinians we're seeing treating them with a ruthlessness and and inhumanity that we haven't seen I think since the Lebanon war the, the first Lebanon war and uh, and there, there's there's a part of me that just that, that that thinks that there's there's within the Israeli leaders that like okay we're in the Middle East well you know you hear this a lot that you know the, the only language they understand is violence and you know or force or they're I think trying to to act like what they think is is the the quintessential 
Arab leader that provides stability by, by keeping themselves in power as opposed to, to providing for their people, um, which is certainly an unfortunate trend that, um, that may come to reflect what the Abraham Accords becomes. Thank you, Michael. Um, let's move to another um, topic that is definitely related. Um, there is now an international outcry about what's happening in Gaza. And um, uh, in every statement of condemnation or expression of concern and so on, you know, we see the idea that it's time for the Palestinians and the Israelis to resume talks, there should be a peace process. And then um, at the center of all this, we see again the idea of two-state solutions. Uh, that's the solution for this um, um, for this situation and so on. Um, do you think, uh, I have uh, various uh, questions here. Um, first, do you think that the two-state solution is still the framework for any solution? Or do you think that it's an illusion? Um, that have been pursued for many years um, and it's not viable. Um, but the second thing here is that um, since the international community will be, we don't know how the, how the conflict will end, um, uh, but one thing that is for sure um, from everything that we have seen in international fora is that there is now a new drive, there is a new push for um, the international community to say enough is enough, some solution <laughs> can be found, and that solution has to be a negotiated solution. It will involve two sides, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, so if there is a new process, what do you think a process should look like um, in light of what we learned from both the, um, the 90s, um, uh, Oslo process, or more recently the Abraham Accords. Um, who should facilitate this process? You know, we heard from you. You know that the Americans acted like lawyers. You know, for the Israelis during the Oslo process, um, and I believe, listening to U.S. officials the way they speak, I think they take it for granted that they are going to lead again. You know, some other process. Um, um, they can't extract even a pause from the Israelis, how they can extract delivering the, you know, a two-state solution um, that they claim is still possible. So what a process should look like, you know, who should facilitate this process? It's a fair question, you know, that um, uh, we can ask. Um, who should participate? Um, in, in the Oslo process, it's, um, it's questionable whether that process was inclusive, whether all Palestinian forces, factions had the buy-in, you know, in that process and were committed to it um, and were equally participating. Um, what should be the format of new negotiations? Um, we hear a number of statements about an international conference again, like the Madrid conference or something similar. Um, um, what should be the agenda if there is a process? Um, should the international community and the Palestinians and the Israelis stick to the making the two-state solution happen? Um, uh, although the viability of, uh, of a Palestinian state is, uh, say at least, questionable. Um, it's not contiguous. It, there are a lot of issues of viability of a sovereign state, you know, in the current geography of what remained of of, of, of Palestinian territories. Um, and then I will end with one question, you know, in this context um, also, um, um, what do you expect is a fair, um, uh, fair uh, expectation of outcomes? Um, and I have one more question that I will leave at the end you know, once you've dealt with this package of questions which all revolve around, if I summarize it, you know, if the war ends um, and there is push from the international community, you know, for a settlement, what the process should look like based on everything that we learned so far <coughs> from history. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, just, I, I would just like to preface it that um, while listening to Michael's very detailed answer to your previous question, it reminded me 
that ironically it was the Oslo agreements that opened the door for this extensive informal Arab-Israeli normalization. Of course, relations have been going back for decades, but it was after Oslo and because of Oslo that those relations um, really began to take off in the 90s. Now, um, with respect to your question, I, I would um, approach it from several different angles. The first is this ongoing discussion and debate about whether as a matter of, 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 of practicality, um, a two-state uh, settlement remains possible or whether we have reached the point of no return. And my response to that, um, and I know many people will disagree with me, is that this is really a question of politics and not of science. In other words, um, the key ingredient in achieving a two-state settlement um, is not demography or geography, but political will. And if you look closer and you compare the situation in Israel and Palestine to other um, uh, historical antecedents, you find that actually um, uh, Palestine, at least in theory, is more conducive um, uh, to um, uh, this kind of resolution than others. So if you take, for example, Algeria, in 1954, the entirety of Algeria, in sharp contrast to the West Bank and Gaza Strip, including East Jerusalem, Algeria was recognized internationally as an, integ as an integral province of mainland France. It was not seen as a foreign territory under occupation. It was seen as part and parcel of France. Yet six years later, it was independent. Ireland, um, at the beginning of the Easter Rising, had been um, uh, an integral part of the United Kingdom uh, for centuries. Um, Eritrea was internationally recognized as an integral part of uh, Ethiopia until um, the day uh, it achieved independence. And, and there are a whole host of examples. Um, and, and so I would argue that the key missing ingredient is um, uh, political will. Now, the problem, of course, with, with the two-state um, settlement is, is that we now have several decades of definitive uh, proof that it is not going to be achieved through bilateral Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, and least of all through bilateral Israeli-Palestinian uh, negotiations under the supervision of Israel's lawyer, um, uh, uh, the United States. And it's also evidently clear that a two-state settlement can only be reached if the West, and particularly the United States, is prepared to expend the political capital um, uh, to compel Israel to end the occupation, because you can't have a two-state settlement without an end um, to occupation. So on the one hand, I would say, yes, a two-state settlement remains viable, um, but in order for it to be achieved, um, the process needs to be entirely transformed. You basically have to throw Oslo into the dustbin of history, then we're half amount of gasoline on that dustbin and set it on fire. Um, and you need an entirely different um, uh, process, which doesn't necessarily require evicting the U.S. from the process, but other partners need to be bought in so that it's under a genuinely international um, uh, uh, supervision or sponsorship in which the opinions of the international community are represented and not only those of either the United States um, uh, uh, or the West. And under those conditions, at least theoretically, one could conceive of situations um, in which a um, uh, two-state uh, settlement could be achieved. And there's another factor that I think argues in favor of a two-state settlement, which is if you compare Israel-Palestine um, uh, to South Africa, 
I think it's fair to say that both Israeli Jews um, and Palestinians have prioritized um, their national identities and 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 their um, preference for um, living in separate entities over living in democratic um, uh, coexistence. It's a very different reality in South Africa. In South Africa, um, you had um, South African whites who were a small minority, who were prepared to relinquish political hegemony in exchange for uh, retaining economic power. I think among Israeli Jews, it's very much the opposite, um, that they have prioritized um, uh, remaining in, in, in an Israeli state, so to speak. So that's kind of the general picture. But I then think, and, and I've written about this, and I've also recently written that that while I think all these all these points remain valid, that I had overseen a key issue um, uh, which needs to be taken into consideration, and that may well mean that a two-state settlement is no longer achievable. And in my view, um, this key issue is that I think it's become legitimate to characterize Israel as an irrational state. And what I mean by um, uh, irrational state is a state that is no longer capable of self-restraint, a state that is no longer capable of inhibition in any way. I mean, we're seeing this very clearly in, um, uh, in the Gaza Strip today. And I think it's also very unfair to characterize this as kind of a natural process that took place within Israel because it's very much a function of the extent to which Israel has been enabled and coddled and encouraged um, by the United States and Europe, which since 1948 have never on a single occasion imposed sustained and meaningful consequences um, on, a, on an Israeli government for conducting policies that these Western states have said they strenuously oppose. So it's almost a natural cycle. You know, um, a state becomes more radical. You don't do anything. So that kind of enables it to become more radical. And it's a vicious cycle until, until ultimately it becomes irrational. And when I look at Israel as an irrational state, I'm not looking only at how it deals with the Palestinians and the kind of you know, lunatic uh, uh, violence that it's uh, unleashing today on the, on the Gaza Strip. I would look more closely, not at how it treats its enemies, but at how it treats its friends and allies and sponsors. You know, for example, during the Obama administration, every time Vice President Biden would come to Israel, someone who's recognized today as the closest friend Israel has ever had in the White House, and this was already known during um, the Obama administration, every time Biden's plane would touch down in Tel Aviv, he would be met by the announcement of a major settlement expansion. Um, in the past month, Israel has denounced the leaders of Spain, Belgium, and Ireland as supporters of terrorism. Um, more recently, you had Israel's um, permanent representative to the United Nations wearing a yellow star to the Security Council as if you know we're in 1930s Nazi Germany um, and demanding the immediate resignation of the Secretary General of the United Nations for making the pedestrian observation that there's a conflict and also you know uh, snarling at all uh, at various other um, uh, senior United Nations officials and demanding their resignation. I mean, you know, when you can no longer distinguish your friends from your enemies, if it was an individual, you would say you need to have your head checked. If it's a state, you would say you need to have your regime uh, looked more carefully into. So I think I'm not drawing any conclusions, but I think these difficult questions need to be asked. And to make a comparison that I know, um, or an analogy rather, which I'm raising as an analogy rather than a comparison. I want to be clear about that. Um, I grew up in Western Europe under the long shadow of the Second World War. And it was very clear um, that 
unless you dismantled um, uh, the Nazi regime and its key institutions, um, peace in Europe would not have been possible. Similarly, in the late 1970s in Southeast Asia, um, the expulsion of American forces uh, from Vietnam was an insufficient condition for peace in Southeast Asia. The Khmer Rouge regime needed to be dismantled and its key institutions dismantled. More recently, in the 1990s, peace in Southern Africa was simply not a viable option until the white minority regime was dismantled um, and its key institutions uh, removed. Um, again, I'm talking about a regime and its key institutions, not about the citizens um, uh, of those states. And the, uh, admittedly, this is not an issue um, I have thought through with um, uh, sufficient clarity to reach um, uh, conclusions about. I, I do think I've thought this through enough to say that these are difficult questions that need to be asked and need to be discussed because I think we've now reached the point where it's not enough to simply have a debate and discussion about whether or not a particular political settlement is viable and can be achieved, we need to also ask, should it be achieved, given these other factors that I've, I've raised? The final point about um, Palestinian representation, I think, you know, when you listen to um, um, uh, these day after scenarios, and, and I would argue this is mainly an American and, 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 and uh, European issue, I don't think Israel has really thought through day after scenarios to quite the same extent. Um, they all um, uh, arrogate to themselves the right to appoint Palestinian representation. And I think unless we get into a situation where Palestinians are given the right um, to choose their own representatives, Palestinians are also not going to be given the option to exercise their inalienable rights. Thank you, Moin. Um, let me turn to Michael. Um, you heard what Moin said. These are difficult questions, but need to be asked. Um, um, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> I, they're connected, but let's separate for a second the two ideas of um, a two-state process and the day after scenario, um, because they could be the same thing, but certainly don't aren't necessarily. Um, they don't have to be. So, with the day after scenario, Israel, and when I say Israel at this point, I'm referring to Netanyahu because he's the longest-serving uh, Israeli prime minister and represents the, the Israeli um, zeitgeist, at least the political zeitgeist, more than than anything else we can point to more than any sort of um, homogenous or uh, monolithic trend. Um, is, is that they're refusing to, to, to even discuss the day after scenario. We, we had leaked uh, a leaked exchange between Secretary Blinken and, and Netanyahu when uh, the Secretary of State mind-bogglingly joined the Israeli War Cabinet meeting, where Blinken said, OK, you don't want the Palestinian Authority in Gaza the best way to kill a bad idea is to propose a better one. And there was just no response. Um, and, and I think that's because the Israeli experience of Oslo and, and really of, of geopolitics in general has been that buying time is its most successful strategy for if not achieving what it wants, and I'm not sure it knows what it wants, then, um, then putting off and keeping at bay uh, imposed solutions from the outside. You know, that's what they did in Oslo, where you had an interim process turn into a 30-year reality of, of occupation and domination and apartheid. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't have any reason to, to think they'll do anything different in Gaza. Um, you know, Israel is saying they don't want the Palestinian Authority, and they insist on having uh, freedom of military oper or freedom of operation militarily forever which is similar to the situation in the West Bank. You know, you have these autonomous little Bantu stands, and, but Israel controls all the borders and all the sort of top level uh, things that determine what 
uh, national or communal or social or economic or political life look like in for for the the occupied population. The same goes for a two state solution. Netanyahu has been saying for a decade, at least publicly, and three decades privately, that he that there will never be a two state solution under his under his leadership, and the majority of parliamentarians um, representing all Israelis, not just Jewish Israelis. But like the majority of total parliamentarians in Israel's Knesset feel the same way, that that there's almost no situation where they would agree to a Palestinian state, at least under the the Oslo um, framework, the Clinton parameters, whatever whatever we're calling that sort of idea that we refer to as Oslo thirty years later. And they have that position because they have a different vision, one of of Israel uh, maintaining control over the entire land of Israel, which is the area between the river and the sea, including the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, um, at the very least having full sort of sovereign control, meaning military, air, radio waves, you know, the borders, which, you know, in, in, invariably um, precludes sovereignty for Palestinians, right? And, and that's why we've seen so many, and, and that is the reality, reality today, which is why we've seen so many um, you know, scholars and, and, and activists and, and policy folks adopt the term one state reality, which, you know, at 972 and even in the New Yorker, people were writing about this a decade ago, but, um, but it's, it's become a little bit more of a popular way to, to understand things today, because it's clear that, that in the absence of any, of any process, in the absence of any peace process or two state process or any kind of process, and with Israeli leaders saying that they're never going to end the occupation, that it's that it is a one-state reality in which there's one effective sovereign over the whole territory, um, where only half the people have rights, where only where the government and the leadership is only accountable to half the population. So we have a situation where you have a one-state reality. Israel refuses a two-state process, and the international community, at least until October sixth has been completely unwilling or unable to even entertain the idea of an alternative than Oslo. And I'm speaking of the, you know, Oslo with the, the, the sort of broader idea of it. So what can be done differently? Um, on October 6th, I was halfway through writing a book exactly about that, uh, which will come out with UC Press next year, um, together with my, my colleague, Sarah Lee Whitson. And, and the basic idea of that is to flip the process. And yeah, I'm not saying this is the only way that, that something could happen, but to, to take the idea that Palestinians and Israelis as monolithic groups or their leaders, their unrepresentative leaders need to first reconcile a national um, conflict, a very you know, deep-seated, emotionally loaded, lots of intergenerational trauma um, filled, you know, with Jews, the, the Holocaust and Palestinians, the Nakba, both of those have been, you know, deeply triggered in, in both populations over the past two months, by the way, which makes it very difficult to talk about any, any sort of um, compromise or, or empathy or willingness, willingness to take risks. But the idea is to flip the process so that, no, you don't, you don't resolve, you don't have to resolve the national issue in order to get to you know, ending the occupation, ending apartheid, um, and and resolving the the issue that that millions of people are denied individual and group rights by another regime that's, you know, at least in theory, democratically deciding to do so. So, you know, that won't happen without immense pressure. Um, that pressure could come from the international community. It could come from an inability to to end unimaginable violence. But, you know, as I mentioned, Israel does not want two states. So, and it does not want to give Palestinian rights in one state. So we're left in an undemocratic one state reality. And the only way to, to, to make Israel even consider um, transforming that situation to something that is not those things is, is by making it pay a price, by making the alternative more costly. And you know, in the current international system, the United States is the only the only actor that can do that. Um, 
And I'm not sure it's possible today, and it's certainly not possible the day after this war, uh, because it requires uh, a reevaluation of of really both um, both Israelis and Palestinians idea of what the manifestation of, of self-determination looks like. And I say that because if we're in an undemocratic one state reality and there's neither a desire nor a process to get to two states, why not just transform the undemocratic one state into a more democratic one state? You know, and there's plenty of, of models for that from, you know, one man, one vote to, uh, to confederation to federation. And they're all they're all possible. Now, again, I don't think that that anybody's going to be entertaining the idea of, of everybody living together after all these intergenerational traumas have been, you know, um, dragged up and and in the in the wake of so much fighting. But but if Israel is successful in, in its goals for the war, and I, I don't want to think about the civilian toll that that'll take because that's really almost too much to, to imagine. But if they're successful in eliminating Hamas's ability to threaten it and its ability to govern Gaza, then it's gonna have a little bit of a harder time making the argument that it can't take the risks involved in a, in a process, that it can't take um, the risks of, of allowing, you know, a Palestinian national movement um, to, to to challenge it from um, from within it's it's you know all of this rests on the international community because without somebody to to come in and and say that like this cannot continue and this war is proof of that this war is too much and and we we need a different path forward and then realizing that there is no other path forward that's pre-written right that the Oslo process, the entire language for, for thinking about um, addressing the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is, is, is dated. It's, it's not relevant anymore. Um, not with the current leaders on both sides, not with the, the situation on the ground. You know, you have hundreds of thousands more settlements today. Um, you know, Israel's strategy of creating disconnection between Gaza and the West Bank not to mention the siege has had devastating consequences on Palestinian society and politics and economy. And instead of demanding that the Palestinians sort of, um, you know, manifest a, a mature democratic political culture before you can sit down and, and have a negotiated process for a two-state solution, which is what you need, right? You can't, you can't have a process if the, the people sitting down in the, in the negotiating room don't have the legitimacy to make decisions. Um, so, so what we're proposing is that, um, if such pressure ever comes to exist and we're not saying how it should come, um, you know, I, I can see more paths toward that situation coming out of this war, but it's certainly not a given. It could go in the other direction as well, that the international community should say, you know what, you need to transform. You need to transform from an apartheid regime, from an occupying regime to a democratic one. And, and to do that, the point of doing that is not because we, the United States, or we, you know, progressive uh, policy folks or, or anti-occupation activists or whatever have the answer, but because under the current situation with the current power dynamics, it is simply impossible to expect a process to work. And yet the alternative is sentencing millions of Palestinian children to, to either grow up under you know apartheid and siege or or be killed in the next war and and that's not acceptable to me and i hope to i hope that many more people in the international community will will come to that conclusion um you know there the, the the point of this project is to demonstrate that there are alternatives as a proof of concept as i said in the beginning this is not the only way to move forward but there are other ways aside from oslo and i, and I really hope that you know aside from from holding accountable uh, the the war crimes um, that are being committed at this moment, that the international community is able to to change its framework for for understanding both its role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but also what's possible and and what 
what has been done before is 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 you know it's it's I, I once saw Danny Dayan the he was at the time the head of the Israeli Settlers Council, Yesha, um, as it was known before the the Gaza disengagement, talking about the Oslo process and and he was bringing it from a um, from a settlers perspective and he was somebody who you know before he became Israeli ambassador to the UN was you know constantly flying around the world trying to convince people of the justness of Israeli settlements and his his argument that that almost floored me at the time was, you know, it's been 20 years. Oslo has not worked. We still have, you know, terrorism. We still have occupation. We still have this, we still have that. The onus, the, 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 the burden of proof is no longer on, on us, the settlers. It's on you. Like, tell me why this isn't sustainable. Now, October 7th, I think, um, validated for a lot of people who have been saying this isn't sustainable, the status quo isn't sustainable. It felt validated by, by I think the not the attacks and not the war, but the for me one of the biggest um, sort of geopolitical things that to, to, is that the ground is no longer stable. It's it's nobody has any clue what next week or next month is going to look like. Not in Tel Aviv, not in Khan Yunus, and, and not. We just don't know. Every the entire paradigm has been um, shown to be more fragile um, than a lot of people assumed it was. And uh, you know, I, I I don't think that Oslo is the answer, and I don't think that this is the moment to pursue two states. Although you know, I if it's achieved justly, I don't I don't think there's inherently a problem with it. Um, but but yeah, it's uh, there. There hopefully will be opportunities or at least attempts to to turn that instability into opportunities for for a different process for for a different future. Thank you, thank you, Michael. This is a, a century old uh, conflict, um, and definitely we're not going to cover it all. You know, in the context of. Um, a brief uh, podcast. Um, we asked lots of important questions. I'm more convinced now with your, with this conversation that uh, these are important questions that it's time, you know, to um, uh, to address them. Um, uh, particularly what we learned uh, from the uh, uh, Oslo process, um, um, what we can be learned from these more recent um, Abraham Accords. Um, and then the question whether the two states solution remain a viable framework um, as it was in the Oslo um, uh, process, or as Michael said, you know, time to contemplate other um, uh, other other alternatives, inclu including transforming the system itself um, that currently exists. Um, um, I would have loved to dip. Um, a bit more uh, to dig more into the um, 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 many of the aspects of the question that we asked, and um, but time is very limited. Let me just end with one question, um, and uh, I will give sixty seconds to each one of you to see whether you can give a, a beginning of a um, um, succinct answer. Where is the UN in all this? Um, the UN is the intergovernmental organization um, uh, with its organs like the Security Council that uh, adopted a number of resolutions regarding this conflict. Um, um, it's the uh, place for international cooperation. It's the place um, from which a number um, mediations, a number of conflicts have emanated. What is the UN today? Um, when you see the diplomacy that's going on, um, you know, it's um, Qatar that is mediating uh, between the Israelis and the and, 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 and Hamas on the issue of hostages and so on. Um, what we see is the UN largely becoming a humanitarian organization. Any reaction, Moin? Yeah, so um... Very briefly, as you requested, I would say the United Nations has gone absent without leave. The Security Council is polarized 
um, and incapable of taking any decisions. And even if it was, it would have to contend with um, the U.S. determination to use its power of veto to shield Israel. I think the more serious issue is with the Secretariat, um, where you have had the largest number of U.N. staff killed in any conflict since it was established. And you have the Secretary General of the United Nations refusing to condemn, refusing to identify who's responsible for these killings, refusing to even call for an investigation into the killings of his own staff. I, I can't imagine this happening similarly in any government or corporation or non-governmental organization where um, the leader simply lifts his hand and effectively says nothing to do with me. And more importantly, he's put out orders to the entire senior echelons of the UN to follow suit, to not condemn or identify um, Israel. I found that when um, Secretary General Guterres um, responded uh, to, to this incredible situation by calling for a minute of silence, I found that very emblematic of the UN's response to this um, uh, entire crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Moeen. Michael, any comments on the UN role? Yeah, I think the the major theme of, of my analysis is that the not the problem, but the answer at this moment is blocked by the United States. And, and that is not, you know, how that manifests in the United, in the United Nations is not only the US's fault. You know, we see similar um, paralysis and polarization and, 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 and in, inability to act um, with Ukraine and other and other conflicts. But, you know, as long as the United States is acting as Israel's lawyer, and as long as the international system is such that five nations can block any, any action within the international system, then, uh, then the UN doesn't really have a whole lot of, uh, to offer. Um, now there are mechanisms that can be strengthened and, you know, the General Assembly has a role in all that. But, you know, if we look at why there hasn't been accountability, it's the United States shielding Israel from, from consequences, primarily in the United Nations. Thank you, Michael. We covered lots of ground, um, um, but I feel that, um, you know, we need um, uh, to focus much more on many aspects of what we discussed. Um, we need many podcasts, to be fair, you know, to dealing with this issue. Um, um, thank you, um, Moin. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank, thank you. you it's been really a pleasure to have you on this podcast. We'll continue tracking this conflict. We'll continue focusing on the dip diplomatic aspects of this, um, how diplomacy will evolve. And um, um, I will say to our viewers, if you like this podcast, please visit our website, um, dialogueinitiatives.org and subscribe to our newsletter, Diplomacy Now. Thank you very much. And um, um, I'll be delighted to have you um, on this podcast again sometime soon. Thank you.